know how I let myself get into this. Um, I must be a complete masochist. I mean, it's one thing for a critic to talk to a director, or a critic to talk to an actor, or a critic to talk to a writer, but to talk to someone who is, bo who is all three of these <laughs> things, who's an actress, a writer, and a director, is, is really overwhelming. Um, I don't think I would have gotten into the ring with Liev Ullman, except for an interview I did, we did, um, almost 20 years ago, when Scenes from a Marriage opened in New York. And I was writing, I was a reviewer for The Village Voice then, and I went to see her at the Pierre, and we just began talking, and it was as if we'd known each other our whole lives. And I wrote this interview, it went on and on and on, and I thought, well, they'll never print this, and they printed the whole thing. And it was a cover story, and everybody said, she's so intelligent. Uh, nobody could believe, I mean, in America, no, no, no actor or actress could be that articulate for that long. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was my, somehow my unique power to have drawn her out this way, but then I read, <laughs> I read subsequent interviews with her, and she was just as articulate, and she always had something new and interesting to say, so she really is a spectacular person to talk to. And then today we met again for the first time since then, and it was as if no time had passed, and we were right back where we'd started from. And I, isn't it astonishing to you to think it was 20 years ago that we did that interview? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, we haven't matured at all, right? Is that it? <laughs> but anyway, it's very exciting for me to be here with her today. Um, what's interesting now is to look back at the films. We've got about five clips of... Um, up to and including Sophie, her, her first feature, the, the first feature she herself has directed and which was shown here last night. And in looking at the clips, not only to get your thoughts on making them and, and what it was like working with Bergman, working with Jan Troell, but in retrospect, as a, dire as a now director, um, how you, what you draw, what you absorbed from them, what of Bergman or Troll you, 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 you T took what you rejected. Um, I was reading your book, the, your second book, Choices, today, and you talk about this is when you were just directing your first small, the, uh, the section of love in Canada. And for the first time, you'd taken over the reins, and you said to somebody, well, they better watch out now because I'm going to get re revenge for all the frustration that I <laughs> suffered as an actress. So you might even be thinking as we're looking at them, what were some of the frustrations that you were... Um, that you did experience in those, and of course, your career as a woman. This is a, very, a really extraordinary thing, particularly to, for us in this country, I think. In France, it's not uncommon for actresses to go into directing. Uh, the, there are several films, uh, um, Christine Pascal, um, Diane Carice actually had a very brief theater career, but Nicole Garcia, um, Brigitte Rouen, a number of, of women have gone from acting into directing, but no one that I know of has gone, has both been both actress and writer and director. So um, we'll start, I guess, appropriately with Persona, which was your first film, wasn't it? Or your first with Bergman? Well, it wasn't my first film, actually. I'd been an actress at the National Theater the in theater, Norway, yeah. yes, for seven years before, and I'd done six or seven Norwegian films and uh, a couple of Swedish films. Uh -huh. But so uh, because he was a man and he was a genius, I was like born there yeah. in the view of other yeah. people. <laughs> in the view of other people, you didn't hear that part of it. <laughs> well, was it true, I th he said somewhere that he saw, he, he had been working with B.B. Anderson and you and B.B. were friends, I think, and maybe you were doing something in the theater together. And there was a snapshot of the two of you in sunlight and he looked and he was struck by the similarity of your faces. Well, what really happened was um, we, B.B. and I had done a film together in the north of Norway from a book of Knut Hamsun. And I came to visit Bibi afterwards in Stockholm and we were walking on the street and like in all these books, this really happened to me, there came Ingmar Bergman. And mm. he had <laughs> worked a lot with Bibi and uh, I was just absolutely 
Uh, numb. I couldn't do anything. I just stood beside her and <laughs> blushed and hoped, you know, he, he wouldn't speak to me, and he didn't speak to me. <laughs> but but I afterwards I got a letter saying that he was preparing this film, which later became Hour of the Wolf, but very differently. And would I have a small part in it? This and was I, Hour of the Wolf. He was talking about. Yes, yeah. something like Hour of the Wolf, yeah. although it wasn't. Uh, similar to that script and and so um, I said yes and by letter and um, just after that he became very ill and had to go to the hospital so mm. the film was cancelled and Bibi and I went to Poland and Czechoslovakia instead to see theater and while we were in Czechoslovakia we got a uh, telegram from Bergman saying come back I'm going to make another film and while he was at the hospital, he had been looking at a photograph of Bibi and me from this film we did in Norway, and he had been struck by the likeness. And as ill as he was, and he probably wasn't ill at all, he just didn't want to do the other film, <laughs> <laughs> he, he decided to make a film based on the likeness, strange likeness between these two women. And in a week or two, he actually got the idea and wrote persona and we had to come home from Czechoslovakia in a car and uh, start filming. filming. Well, we'll talk about some interesting things that happened then, but for, for those of you who, who haven't seen it, don't, you probably everyone has probably seen it, but this is this fierce psychological duel between two women and Liev Ullman plays an actress who in the beginning of the film suddenly makes a vow of silence to herself that she will not speak anymore and B.B. Anderson is the nurse, Alma, very eager to please, uh, trying to oblige, who's sent with her to this island. I guess that was Faro, was that where was it was filmed. That was Faro, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's almost, uh, it's one of these relationships almost like an analyst and a patient, where the analyst is quiet and the patient just keeps talking and talking and talking. So this very strange kind of um, psychological crossover occurs. And this is a scene, I think a lot of critics have felt this is one of the more erotic scenes ever filmed in movies and it's the scene in which B.B. Uh, Anderson describes a sexual encounter and Lee Ullman being silent through the whole film. It's the most extraordinary job of acting by someone who never says a word and we're always we're seeing the, the, the scene not only through B.B.'s eyes but as Lee Ullman is listening to it. So we'll have that clip from Persona now, Patrick. Still, that's, that scene is still one of the most powerful <clears throat> things I've ever seen, and it's because you don't, don't see anything. Well, you know what's actually a shocking thing to start with, really? <laughs> but uh, yeah. what happened, not long after that, Bibi, after it had opened in the United States, Bibi and I were in New York, and we did a, an interview on TV with Dick Cavett. Mm. And he asked us, well, how did it feel to have this love scene together, being naked and have a love scene with another woman? And we said, so we didn't do that. Yes, you did. And he wouldn't give up. He had seen that we were naked and had a love scene yeah. together. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's uh, just like Hitchcock. You know, everybody who's seen the shower scene in, uh, in Psycho, they believe that they have seen that Janet Lee was stabbed. Yeah. But in actual fact, you never, never see the murder. But it's your fantasy which is it's always which is a more brilliant powerful. way. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, also this idea, and I think it was Bergman that said this somewhere, talking about the way you act during that scene, it's, it's like your eye, it's, it's incredibly subtle, and yet it's like your lips got fuller. There was something sort of flushed and full as you were enjoying this thing, <laughs> vicariously, this vicarious experience of it. It was amazing. <coughs> But to begin with, and it is sort of a strange thing to start the evening with, but it's, it's, it's somehow... <laughs> Who made the choices? <laughs> no, I don't like, I'm responsible for everything. It's not there. It's just one that I, I used to illustrate when I, when, in talking about eroticism in the cinema and how less is often more and how what is just... First of all, it's voyeurism at three removes, really, because... Um, it's B.B. telling of a story and her halting and her personality coming into it and um, it's like I was just looking at a film by Diane Curie's Entre Nous which you may have seen and, and there's a scene where she has a, a love scene with a soldier and she tells her friend afterwards it's, just, it's a very impersonal sex and she tells her friend afterwards about it and the whole first of all it's 
it's women having this, it's the idea is that men like impersonal sex and women don't, and yet these are two scenes that I think women very much understand in which women are getting turned on by this idea mm -hmm. of impersonal sex, and it's turning on not only her, but your character. But this was, uh, wasn't, didn't you start the film with some difficulty and then kind of get into it as time went on? Or? Well, in the beginning, uh, you know, I was still shy and, and didn't talk, and, and luckily in the film I don't <laughs> talk either. <laughs> But Bergman has said later that, you know, the first few days he was a little scared. What have I done? I made this plan to make this picture and wrote it in 14 days. And, you know, uh, here is this Norwegian who doesn't talk and <laughs> blushes all the time. <laughs> but then uh, it went wonderful. And uh, because although, and I must say, I was only um, 25 at the time, and I was playing a woman much more mature than I, an actress who had decided that she didn't want to talk anymore because she felt that words had been misused so much, also in her case. And I didn't understand the complications of all this, although I understand it today much more. But I instinctively understood one thing, and that was that Ingmar was in the soul of this lady. Mm. And because I, without words, really understood a lot about him or recognized a lot about him, I knew I'll just be him. So, uh, you know, I just tried to listen with my inner ear to who he was. And that's why he stopped using really Max von Sydow to be him in films and he started to have a, a woman doing mm. these parts. Because uh, except for scenes from a marriage, I think I very much was um, the soul His alter ego. Yeah, yeah. of Bergman. Well, to, um, to, and we'll get back to more Bergman later, but to, to go to The Emigrants, that was a film that you did with Jean Troel <coughs> in 73, I think. Did you do two versions of that, one in, in Swedish and one in English, or did you just dub the Swedish no, version? No, that, that was only done in one version. We did two films. The we did land. the emigrants and the new land, and we did them simultaneously. You oh, you know. did? Yeah. Uh -huh. So one day I was 17, and the next day I was giving birth to the child number 10 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our difficulty was really with the children, because she was either pregnant or giving birth. And we had to know, you know, all the time, how big is her stomach today and what child, because the stomach was supposed to go up and down depending on, on age. And the continuity. The continuity of that <laughs> film headache. was really difficult. And you can see strange continuity things, for example, with the costumes, when the emigrants come to uh, America for the first time and, and land in New York, you will see, and they see a, a black man for the first time. Mm. And you will see that he has a wooden clogs from Sweden, you know. <laughs> so the, the, the costume lady had not done her research <laughs> very well. <laughs> did, did that stay in the film? Oh, yeah, he yeah. had to. Where he was, he was despairing often in yeah. editing, he, he told us, because of this, mm -hmm. very much because of the um, costume lady who was is wonderful, but she she really didn't do her homework the way other people did. Because if I was to wear worn clothes, she would come to the breakfast table some days and said, oh, I slept in the clothes tonight, so they w will really look a little worn, you know. And then I had to wear them that whole day. She had <laughs> really very strange... Um, <laughs> um, well, this is a leave-taking scene. Do you want to maybe give the background of this particular scene when you're leaving? Well, we worked there, you know, many people, they, when they think of Sweden and Swedish directors, they think of Ingmar Bergman, but even he says that if he ever stranded on an island and could have only one film for the rest of his life, he would want to have uh, This Is Your Life, which is the first film made by this uh, genius, he's really a genius, Jan Trell, who's both a cinematographer and a director, but he's very shy. He, he doesn't really know how to speak or explain what he wants. But because he's the cinematographer and he also is the operator of the camera, that's where he does the poetry. Mm. And we never really knew. He let us walk around the way we wanted and, you know, fix the acting because he felt he's good actors and they can do their thing. But what he did with his camera, it was like a painter. With his camera, he would 
make the music. And we never knew if he was on the face or the hands or the feet or anything. And this scene we are seeing now when they leave for America, their husband and the wife and their children, uh, in the script, you know, you read it's the scene where they wave, they're sitting in the carriage with the children and they're waving to the old parents who are left standing behind uh, uh, the gate and they're seeing them obviously for the last time in their life to go to the new land. And I thought, oh, this is really going to be moving. I'm sure now his camera is going to be on close up of me all the time because I was famous for, you know, how to be sad at the appropriate moments. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, when we saw the rushes, saw the scene as he had seen, you know, he knew so much more and had made such a much better choice the way I remember it. I haven't seen it for many years. Because he showed also the reason for these people leaving. He let the camera wander on the fields. And the fields of corn, the, the corn was sparse, and you just saw the stones and all the hardship that these people really had to leave, the poverty. And he showed the tiny, tiny parents. They were so tiny, and you could see that they were left forever. It is so moving, the, the vision he gives of a goodbye forever, which is so different than just going into a face and showing um, tears. No, I hope I'm not misremembering, <laughs> no, and that's what we see. Okay, <laughs> Patrick, we'll see that clip now. So that is an incredible shot, that zoom and then the dissolve, that, that overlapping is really yeah. very powerful. And you know, the strange thing, a lot of this movie was done in the areas uh, around here, and uh, what you found, uh, this, the Swedish part was uh, done in Skåne in Sweden, but what we found was that the nature was so similar uh, here yeah. as there, and you, you knew why the emigrants choose this land, because it was like home. And we literally could do uh, scenes, you know, where we went into the woods and uh, on one side of a tree, we filmed it in Sweden, and on the mm. other side, we were <laughs> here. And you can't see the difference. Yeah. And this is where they were supposed to have settled. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you'll find, uh, I'm sure, even in this cinema today, a lot of their ancestors, yeah. I think. <laughs> um, one that we wanted, I wanted to show now, <clears throat> but the print was dubbed. I mean, this is your own dubbing, but this print was passion, The Passion of Anna, and it was not, not well dubbed. But it's interesting, it's right after this that Bergman made this, and it's very sort of modernistic. It's the one where the, the actors speak to the camera and describe their parts. Um, uh, Max von Sydow plays a character named Andreas Winkelmann, and, he gets in, and you have previously been married to someone named Andreas who's had a terrible accident and you're having nightmares, and there's one scene which we were gonna show where you have this long monologue in a boat where you're telling the story of your marriage, which you tell in sort of glowing, beatific terms and, and, and apparently honest. I mean, it's impossible to sort of look at you and not believe you, and then in the end, the rug is pulled out from under this, and it turns out that, um, that you've actually, I mean, the, the, the marriage was terrible and that he's left you, uh, or, or that there's been a, a rupture, a viol it's a very violent film too, there's tremendous, um, this is the one that takes place on an island and an at one point a whole bunch of animals are slaughtered and a man commits suicide because everyone thinks he's done it. So there's just tremendous both physical and psychic violence in the film, but what's interesting is how you seem to be one thing and then you reveal to be something very different. And I think that, that happens in a lot of the Bergman films with you. He, he captures something there that's very deceptive in you. Um, in, in the character, not in the character. Not in you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, for, first of all, going, going back to the, he, he had seen you um, in this uh, photograph with Bibi, but what, what was your previous, did he draw on your previous roles or did he sort of envision you in a completely other way than you had been before? I mean, this, this idea that you were suddenly were the person who, who was known for, for emoting on the screen or being anguished, where did that come from? Well, that came 
from him because I hadn't been anguished that way in any film before. Yeah. Certainly, but I I know that he recognized it in me or my capacity to do that, and it was both my wonderful luck, of course, to to meet a filmmaker like that, who who really felt he could use me. But it was also, in some ways, not only luck because it meant that. For all the years I worked with him, although I did other work also, this of course was the most important, that um, only one side of it froze what I you felt in that I image, could do for, for people, yes, because uh, I'm, I'm basically a much more happy person and I'm much more in harmony with the womanhood than uh, his characters are, mm. but then on the other hand his characters are more a re re reflection on him. Um, so maybe I at times felt, you know, uh, specifically afterwards, uh, I wonder what my life would have been like if I could have um, projected more positive images or more images like scenes from a marriage, because I, I like that character, than always talk about the neurosis of, um, of a woman mm. inside. Uh, it, actually, you know, my philosophy is it, it, it's not as important to me as it obviously is to him. And yeah. then to be the, the, the media, the, the spokes, vehicle, for, the his, vehicle yeah. for this, the spokesperson for that is uh, uh, sometimes a, a little frustration. Yeah. yeah. Because I've, I've done so many other things. But, mm -hmm. some but that's of what everyone things. remembers. They're so vivid yeah. and so stark. Yeah. Well, it seems from a marriage is actually, though, more. I mean, Earl and Josephson would be more the Bergman character in that to some depth. Yes, I, I, I feel, uh, yes, so I am a, sure. You're a little freer in that to be yourself. Much freer because yeah. it's, it's the only movie I feel where, where Bergman really shows a woman that has difficulty coping with life and then she overcomes it and, and works with it. It's not, you know, some suffering inside of her, but it's really life presenting itself to her and her then you know, working with that, coping with that, and and yeah. I just yeah, it's uh, less him sort of confronting the universe than confronting marriage. I mean, well, yes. one of the things is the format because originally it was, of course, made for Swedish television in how many ten parts or well, uh, it was always thought of to be a film in the end, I think, but it was financed like all his movies mm. uh, almost by Swedish television. So he first had to give it to them, and it was made uh, in a six episode six. each was one hour and uh, believe it or not we did the whole six hours in uh, six weeks mm. and we did again everything in uh, Fora and in a barn that he had made into a film studio and um, Alan and I, we had to learn our text very quickly. We met each morning at four or five just to go through the dialogue. It was really hard work and it was cold because it was in Ireland, although it was summer and and we had, you know, it, this was not Hollywood, you know, we had a, a dressing room where we had to change and do everything like a tiny little caravan, just really small in the garden of his very wonderful house. <laughs> <laughs> where he As, was. <laughs> where he was with his wife. And, you know, the, actually this house which he once um, built for me, you know. <laughs> And, uh, and oh, you know, <laughs> but this was, of course, many years after. Yeah. So, uh, and, and Alan and I, because we were tired and we were frustrated and we felt, you know, to do such a big movie in, in six such weeks, conditions. just because we could learn text, he was making this cheap production. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a wonderful time, you know, sitting in our caravan between takes and bad mouthing and him about. and then pitching. <laughs> <laughs> Bitching about him, and I can remember, and we we were allowed to go into the the, the big house. house only if we had to use the, the <laughs> ladies' room. And I can remember once I was had been there, and I was coming back to our caravan, and I had thought of something wonderful to say, you know, and so I rushed into the caravan into the door here and Alan is sitting there and I say, oh, you won't believe it, you know, she's reading, you know, magazines in the toilet because I'd found the magazine. And I went on and on, but Alan, my play friend, he was looking so strange. And so I turn and there is Ingmar sitting and with a smile. Oh, I was so scared. <laughs> and I didn't, and I just said, 
I will not survive this. And, and, so, and I, I was this I'm not going to survive. And I ran out, and I didn't know where to run. It's an island. I couldn't. <laughs> you know. So I found on the, on the, somewhere behind the house, there was a, where they put wood in the winter. And I just crept in there and put the lid on. And I decided, I'm never coming out. <laughs> it just disappeared. <laughs> ah, yes. And everybody was coming, you know, opening the lid and saying, you know, you have to come out. He's not. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't dare to come out. And finally, Ingmar came and knocked on the lid because they had told him she's never coming out. And he says what he will never understand, that not only did he have to come and knock on the lid, he also had to say, I'm sorry. Uh, that was <laughs> and I think that's the only time he said, I'm sorry. In your whole relationship. And, and he hadn't done a thing. What? What, was there a little bit of sadism in that, in him putting you in this situation or no, no because he didn't know that we were bad mouthing him all the time you know he, he thought, thought we were perfectly. worshiping him <laughs> <laughs> well this is as you'll remember the, the the story of this marriage and it's breaking up and the all the the vicissitudes they go through and this is the scene where Erlon Josephson is leaving for another woman and the strange thing is, I remember this scene as one in which you packed his suitcase to go. Didn't I? I thought so, but it's not in this clip. I don't know where it is, but we'll see, because I remembered it that way. Several people that I talked to remembered it that way. So do I. All right, well, it must have... <laughs> it either, either we're misremembering it or it got... It, or it's it, like Dick Cavett. We think we've yeah, seen yeah. something, which is... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, Patrick, the clip. I'm sure that that part that you did pack the suitcase, though, it's just gotten clipped out. Mm, this is the movie version, and you oh. must have seen a TV version, yeah. too, because it's a much longer, longer scene, scene at the breakfast table, and then she does go and, and pack his <laughs> suitcase. You know, these strange, self-destructive things woman. you do sometimes when you are a woman, or, or when you are... Left, or you're scared of losing somebody. You say and you do things that are completely. I mean, having this very polite conversation at breakfast and talking about all the things as if they were going to be together forever. Right. Um, well, I remember talking to you about this at the time and how people w would have arguments. About, I think in Sweden and also in the U.S. have arguments about the film and disagreements and. Some men would say, well, how can he leave her? She's so beautiful. And I told you this. And you said, well, of course he could look at her. She's just walking around with a, these glasses, and she's plain and pathetic and <laughs> sort of holding on to him. And you felt that she was, really was very unattractive and undesirable. Because she isn't honest with yeah. who she is. She's a little like uh, Nora in uh, Ibsen's a doll's, uh, house. doll's House. You know, she's, she's whining. And she's saying, oh, do you want me to do this? Do you mm. want me to do that? Instead of, you know doing this and saying, uh, shame on you, what you're yeah. going to do now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or instead of getting enraged. I mean, she yes. finally breaks down after he leaves, but she never does to him. Well, also what's interesting, and, and we talked about this before, and it's very clear. We couldn't show the, this clip. It would just take up too much time. But there's a scene in the very end of the film where, where she and Josephson have a temporary reconciliation. And she's having a nightmare, and he's consoling her. And they have a, a wonderful conversation. I mean, there's been this running thing all the way through where she wants to always talk about the relate they're in bed at night and she wants to talk about the relationship and he just wants to go to sleep like all like so many couples i mean this is the sort of ongoing battle that the minute the woman wants to talk about the relationship the man can't, he he needs no sleeping pills he's a, he's asleep but in this scene she looks fantastic you look fantastic in that last scene and it's like what happens to certain women after sometimes after their husbands die or they suddenly come into their own and she's just absolutely transformed. I mean, you, I mean suddenly, you know, you, your hair is free and you look free. There's a sort of light in your eyes that isn't in the earlier scenes. And, and there's a complete kind of transformation. Well, yeah, I think, you know, for everyone, not only women, but they experience it sometimes more, also men, once you start to rely on your own strength and once you start to say yes to what is you and not only yes to what is somebody else's, version of life, you do start uh, mm. blooming. You, you bloom in a wonderful way, uh, much more than today, you know, when women, in a false sense, I think, of liberation, they start trying to bloom by facelifts and aerobics and so. And mm. again, you know, we have failed this one thing where we really should Find do it. something with ourselves. And 
within. It's strength within. It's using the female language. It's mm. using everything that is descriptive of feminine values. And that's it. And yeah. And, and finding that you are a whole person, that you're not half of a unit, but a whole person. Right. That's what she finds because in sometimes uh, women in marriages, and I've been so myself, and Marianne there in this film certainly was so, she's not even half of a person. Mm. She's a quarter of a person, and she's presenting this thing which isn't her at all, and which, of course, to a man in the end is burdensome. If she's presenting this to be loved, she's not going to be loved by it. Because she hasn't loved herself. She can't love herself. No, she person. doesn't love herself. Yeah. And, and who wants a, a whiner, mm. you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of whiners, uh, Autumn Sonata, the film that you made with Ingrid Bergman. And <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a fascinating. I'm, I, I'm using quite a, a lot from this film, but two scenes here. One is this, Ingrid Bergman is, of course, the concert piano, the mother concert pianist who's, who's lived all over the world and, and very little with her daughter who comes back and there's, a, so there's a, a showdown between mother and daughter. But the two scenes here, one is the one where they're at the piano together and the other is, um, I guess we'll show it right after that, the, the, the confrontation scene. Well, that is interesting and actually I told a story last time I was in Minnesota but it's worth repeating, hoping that other people are here today <laughs> because uh, when Ingmar wrote the script of uh, Autumn Sonata he wrote a script about a woman who had said yes to herself and she was a pianist and had uh, traveled a lot playing piano in concerts while her children were small and then the daughter that I play continuously in life until she's 40 years old which she is in this film uh, wines and wines of this mother who left her so often alone when she was little and well that was maybe bad but at 40 you should stop whining and, and blame your mother I feel and, and both Ingrid and I who were both uh, women who had been working all our lives we found that it was very unfair to to have a script like that where where the working mother was made into some terrible person and and the daughter was made into this sweet person who was destroyed. Because if it had been a man, I mean, this was written by a man who's hardly said uh, good night to his children. And, mm -hmm. and you know, just because it's, it's a woman, he wrote it. And we said, could you kind of change a little the, the words? Because it isn't fair. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. and, and then we said, well, can we act? against our characters a little and he said sure that's interesting you are actresses and so we really did act very much against the characters that were in the script you know I made my 40 year old with pigtails often and this whiny voice and Ingrid gave a lot of integrity and strength to her character but there was one scene, and I think that's the second scene we see, where the daughter goes on all night and whining and whining, saying, oh, you did this to me, you did this to me, and terrible. And she is frustrated, you know, very frustrated and very upset. And in the end, when the morning comes and the daughter finally shuts up, you know, there, the, the mother has like two lines, and it is, uh, please hold around me, please love me. And actually, when I read that, I thought, oh, this is beautiful. I wish I could say, say this, because it would be so moving. And so I was looking forward to hear Ingrid do that scene. So we did all my scene first, a long monologue, pages and pages. And finally, then, Ingrid was, after having heard this the whole night, how terrible she had been, her scene was to be, please hold around me, please love me. But then when we come to this, Ingrid says, I can't say that. I want to slap her in the face and leave the room. <laughs> and it was fantastic. And Ingmar got so upset because we had promised not to interfere with the lines, you know. And he said, well, you have to say it. And she said, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And they started quarreling. And so they went out in the corridor and we heard these voices. And we thought, you know, nobody had said no to Ingmar before. He's the genius. We all knew that. And we thought the picture is going to be over, everything is finished. And finally, it became quiet in the corridor, and 
the two of them came in. He had won. He was the genius. She was the woman. And <laughs> she, was, <laughs> she was to say the lines. And I don't know if it's still there. I hope it is there. She did say the lines. Please hold around me. Please love me. Forgive me everything. But her face, her face is the face of women who in generations have had to say, I'm sorry I exist, I'm sorry I did this, I'm sorry I did that, I'm sorry I can't be all these roles at once. It's the face of a woman who is so angry, but she knows the ritual demands of her, mm. continue to say, I'm sorry. And it's Ingrid Bergman. It's, mm. For me, it's so historic and she's so much better than you know mm. what I think Ingmar would ever have um, expected. That's so interesting because I, I, I had strong reservations about this film for precisely those reasons but I always felt that maybe you were on his side that it was maybe the two of you ganging up against Ingrid oh, Bergman no. <laughs> because I did feel that this whole issue of the mother why isn't isn't she entitled to some um, honor for this career that sure. she's had but she's being punished 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 all the way through. And the strange thing who d does he pick to do these two roles? He picks women, two women who are famous for, you know, traveling around doing mm. career stuff, you know, yeah, yeah. with their children. And, and Ingrid has always been with her children in spite of what the newspapers were writing. And you have been writing. a very conscientious mother as well. So to sort of, but this is the way guilt is, oh, is sure. induced in women, yeah. is this, this idea that they're never quite adequate to the task of mothering. But there is this brilliant, the, the first scene also is one in which everything is done through the eyes, I think, of the, the piano playing scene, and every child will recognize. Yes, because we also have to say that there are strong women often who are so perfect, they feel, in what they do, that they literally, by just being so good at it, that they really push down R the, the child, you know, in their kindness, showing that. Well, I think also, you know, I've just been reviewing this book on Marlene Dietrich by her daughter, Maria Riva, and oh. it's a fascinating book. But the thing is, and of course, as, as you might expect, Marlene Dietrich was a, was a monstrous mother. She was. I mean, she was fantastic in other ways, and she did in incredible things to the daughter. But you've got to look at it in two different... I and mean, the daughter is always going to seek revenge in these situations. She can't help it. I mean, she's been stifled, and especially if the, if the mother is um, just a superstar in that way and has lived the kind of the life that Marlene Dietrich did and which was not motherly in any way. But there is the, the two things coexist, the daughter's viewpoint and the viewpoint of the world of those who have appreciated the artistry mm -hmm. of the mother. Well, unfortunately, uh, my daughter has chosen as a career a writer, so, you know. Uh oh <laughs> <laughs> Mommy dearest, here we Mommy come. Mommy dearest. All right. All right. No. Um, no, she wouldn't do that. She wouldn't do that. <laughs> I don't know if he can go right to the next one. Um, it's interesting with, with Bergman that he never will acknowledge that uh, artistic achievement or the life of the intellect are a reason for living. I mean, he's so much, especially for his women. His women are not allowed to be intellectuals ever. They must be earth mothers. Don't you? This is... Uh, yes, in his films, but strangely enough, in, in reality, he's a great admirer of achievers, mm -hmm. you know. It doesn't have to be a high achievement, but somebody who really wants to achieve something with their life, whether yeah. they are a, a man and, or, or a woman. So I think in the films he's reflecting a lot of what the young boy Bergman felt about maybe his own mother about him himself so much more mm. in the films than than it's um, ever in the real life mm. i feel that all his films maybe with the exception of fanny alexander it's been a struggle with the with the childhood and suddenly he was set free and strangely enough uh, then he stopped uh, making mm. films altogether and now he only wants to write it's like he's found Something. This piece, well, yes. Best Intentions, I think, is just a marvel of coming to terms with yes. one's parents. Yes, yes. Incredible. Yes. Um, can you do the, the other one, Patrick, now? Is that... Now, <clears throat> this was really the end of the scene because all that shouting to the mother happened before, and obviously she has more lines than I, I remember mm. the mother, but that face, Mm -hmm. It's a very different face Ingrid is showing than, you know, the other face we saw while she was playing mm. theatre. And it's very, very much against the text in mm -hmm. some ways, hating 
to say every word of it. Because he's humiliating her. The, the dialogue is completely humiliating her, and what she's having to say is humiliating. It is. But the strange thing is, uh, the other child you hear that says, Mama, come, come, that is the child that is crippled and which is lying on the top floor. And both these children, I feel in a way, they are Ingmar Bergman, mm -hmm. the one which is absolutely unforgiving to the mother. And then the other one, which is all the time saying, mm -hmm. Mama, Mama, please uh, uh, see me. And I think it's only now in the recent years when, when Ingmar Bergman's own mother died and then he read her diary and found out, you know, so many things he never knew about mm -hmm. her. It's only then that he finally, as you say, came to terms with uh, who he is yeah. because he allowed the mother to have had her own life as well, that she wasn't only on earth to be his mother mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. thus failing because she wasn't what he needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and, and women are so much the center of his whole vision that they're going to be the negative and the positive, the idealized and the degraded. They just, that, and it's interesting that he has stopped making films now that he has come to terms. I don't know if that, that anguish, that's where the anguish came from, I guess, and that's what the, the that was what the anguish issued yes. in, in the film. I think he was very, because he wrote all his scripts himself, and I don't think he could make a film on somebody else's script. and. Without that anguish, he feels um, this media is, is not more for him. He still is doing a lot of theater, and first and foremost, he is uh, writing, mm. writing uh, books and also uh, scripts. Uh, it's really, I'm uh, the, uh, Fanny and Alexander, which is the last film he did, uh, he also wrote for me, and he had been, you know, for a long time on the phone talking. Uh, about this wonderful film, and now I, you know, I, I wouldn't have to do this neurotic person anymore. And I just visualized, you know, <laughs> finally something, you know, warm and beautiful. And then when he sent the script, you know, the way I read it then was, oh, it's another one. I can't do these nightmares anymore. <laughs> and I really did the one artistic bad choice of my life. I, I. I sent him a telegram and said, you know, somebody else will have to do your nightmares. I don't know what went mm. into me. And for one and a half year, we, we didn't speak. And then, you know, he understood. And uh, I, I regret it because that yeah. turned out to be his best films in many ways because there was also something very life-affirming in the film. Um, and I never saw the film because of this, because that would have been to too, yeah. yeah. Which, and now it irritates me because some people say that the film I made and directed, that that is so much inspired by Fanny Alexander. I haven't even seen the film. <laughs> <laughs> so he got his revenge without knowing it. <laughs> well, I don't think it really is, um, that, which brings us to Sophie. And of course, everyone wants to know, is it Bergman-esque? Is it? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I guess the only one that it would bear any similarity it would be Fanny and Alexander only because it's period um, and it deals it's, it's a saga it deals with the family but other than that I think it's very much your film um, how did you should we show the clip first and then talk about talk a little bit about it first maybe uh, it's a novel how, how did it come about uh, well I got the novel which it is based on sent to me and they asked me if I would do a manuscript on this novel and I thought that's really nice, they want me to do a film manuscript. And so I said, yes, just being honored. And while working on it, and then finally finding out that I had to really make a choice because the novel goes in so many directions, mm. I, I wanting to focus on the woman and uh, her life. It wasn't called Sophie, I take it. No, no. It, it was, it's really a family chronic. Yeah. And when I sent, you know, my ideas to the producers, they wrote me back and said, would you like to direct it as well? Because they liked my ideas. And I thought, they must be joking. Shall I direct the film? And only on the press conference, actually, when they were announcing the film was to be made, did I realize they meant it because they said, well, she's also going to direct it when the script is finished. And, I, and this was in Denmark. And I can remember going from the press conference to the airport and calling 
Ingmar and saying, mm. "You just watch out now," uh, <laughs> because <that's what> <laughs> and it was <laughs> it was so uh, lovely. And um, although I had never never dreamt of being a, a film director, after having done it, I can say that uh, I really feel that the more than 30 years I've been. And after, it's been a preparation. I just feel it's been a preparation yeah. because I feel the mixture of writing and putting your own visions up there with the help of all the wonderful people you work with. That's really where I feel um, most yeah. at home. Yeah. Also because as as an actress, you know, the older you get, the more frustrated you get because you have to sometimes work with bad directors. You have to sometimes work with bad words, and really the older you get the harder that gets to be and you know since I I'm not quiet anymore and I, I, I feel sometimes I have to tell them you know just to be helpful and and they don't like that <laughs> they don't welcome your suggestions then. no no but uh, and that's why it is and also I think I came to the work with one of the best things a director can come with. I knew, especially from working with bad directors, uh, what not to do, what not to say. That's very important. I, I like what kinds of things? Everything, because you, you ask people to work with you because you believe in their talent, because you believe in their ability to create something. So they are not supposed to, when they are to do their thing, to just do a blueprint of what you had been thinking of at home. With the actors, for example, you, you have to give them a wonderful blocking, a space to move in, a, a beautiful living room, colors, everything right, and then say, I'd like the scene to be like this and this, and then sit there and watch them create, watch them give with their face and their body and their voice what their experience is, what they have understood of that character. And then just make sure that everything you can hear or see them trying or doing expressively, that that comes on the screen. You are to be there as a lover, as somebody to whom they have the trust of the world and want to open up as much as possible because that's going to make beautiful scenes but if you go to them and say well listen now you're going to be very angry and you know your face should really cloud over and everything you have trampled into their fantasy life like an elephant and you'll never get anything yeah, so you have to trust them and, and of course casting is key to that too the, the woman that plays Sophie, I've never seen her before. Is, who is she? Well, she is uh, primarily a theater actor. They are all primarily theater mm. actors, and all of them are Danish except Arland Josephson, who plays the, the, father. the father of the main character. I, for the main character, and she has to go through 20 years, I met with a lot of actresses. And again, because I'm an actress myself, I didn't want them to go through the humiliation of having to test for me. What I knew was important was to, to see what kind of type they were. And when we were uh, talking together, you know, really listen and see what kind of experience they were interested in uh, giving to a film. And when I met her, I was uh, very sure at, at, mm. at once that uh, this is the kind of woman I would uh, love to work with. And before the film started, maybe I was nervous that because the part she's playing is something that I could have done at least before and I was scared maybe I'm going to want her to be like, be like me mm -hmm. but it never happened mm -hmm. it was such a joy you know to be on the other side of the camera and not have the ambition of you know oh getting up another feeling and show it in the face again mm -hmm. but having somebody else surprise you mm -hmm. and you know the wonder of seeing somebody feeling um, secure, feeling loved, seeing somebody bloom with the material that you have been part of giving them. It was, uh, it's great. I, I can't wait to, to do it uh, again. again. Yeah. And I have such admiration for these uh, actors that uh, was part of this film. And, and everybody, in fact, connected specifically on the artistic side. You know, the set designers, they gave rooms to move in. Where There are so many details, and the details you cannot even see on the film, but the actors saw them, you know, and the details inspired the actors mm. to do more. The one difficulty was with the crew, 
because they were the only ones I, I hadn't met before we started filming. And you know, here I come, I'm, uh, I'm middle-aged, I'm a woman, I'm an actress. That's three handicaps Strikes at one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they were just ready for me. I felt that. Yeah. And it, it took 14 days, really, um, for, for us to, to work together because my language was different. Not because I was Norwegian and they were Danish, but because I, I had decided I am not going to whine because they're going to wait for that. I'm not going to cry <laughs> and I'm not going to be bossy and things like that because it's not in my nature. I am going to use your normal. my normal language. And there's a lot of things I don't know how to express, you know, technique things with the camera and whatever. So I would say, you know, I would like the, the camera to move slowly over there and then just stop in the dance there and, and go further. Stop in the dance? What are you talking about? How no. many centimeters and, you know, use the right expressions here? And we had a lot of problems like that in the beginning. Or I would, you know, say, I'm going to get some coffee. Do you want me to get you some coffee too? Is she out of her mind? Is she mm -hmm. going to get us coffee now? You know, it was things like that, that they really felt I was a little cuckoo. Mm -hmm. and, and then well, after, Maybe they wanted you to feel that way a little bit too. Oh, sure. And yeah. I did. And, and they also did this thing that sometimes men don't know they do. And sometimes women do it too. They make you invisible. You come to them and you stand there and you are supposed to be the one to give decisions and they don't hear you and they don't see you and they continue with what they were talking about and suddenly they have left and you are there. I was supposed to be the boss and they have all left and it's very frightening. And then you can just decide to be invisible or to go after them and say, okay, maybe my language isn't so clear, yeah. but still, this is the way I want it. And after 14 days, when they saw the rushes and, uh, and you know, even the cinematographer who told me in the beginning, I said, could you please make a pan there or and zoom in there? He said, we don't zoom these days. <laughs> we don't zoom these days. And I was so insecure, so again, I called poor Ingmar and I said, is it true? Don't they zoom in films anymore? <laughs> <laughs> and and in the end, I have to say, the cinematographer and we were so close. I, and he, this man who had said in the beginning he didn't want to pan, he didn't want to zoom. I couldn't hold him still. He was he was operating, he was panning, he was zooming. He had a ball. <laughs> but it was really a, a question of. Uh, power. Mm. In those 14 days, I, I never want to have back, mm. I must say. But... Um, well, it's the testing, that they're testing you. And they, they, and, were and, testing. and they create a sort of mystique that's a male mystique. And this is, I think, one of the reasons so few women have been able to get into directing, because there's this idea that somehow they can't do it, that there are all these arcane terms that you have to know, which is all nonsense. No, you, know, you yeah. don't need to, because that's what they are supposed to know. Yeah, exactly. The grades of the yeah, lamps, that's you what, know. That's their job. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, yeah. but the worst thing is, and you know, it's when they make you uh, invisible. And mm -hmm. I, I, I would just love for people to, and my film is very much about that too, that look out, if you are close to somebody, there might be somebody over there who is needy and wants to be part of it. And I've tried in the film to give many mm -hmm. images of this, of, uh, uh, Actually, the 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 the, the uh, woman, the lead woman in her very unhappy marriage, I feel that her husband he dies because he dies. He's never seen. He becomes mm. invisible. You know, he's always on the outside, and uh, I think it would be so great if mm. people could. That's just very cryptic. See I'd like to t ask about that after yeah. we look at the clip. Um, it's about a, a, Jewish, a, Jewish com a Jewish family, a Jewish community in turn of the century Denmark, and Sophie is, I think, 29 at the beginning, unmarried. Um, the, the scene, well, there's a scene, a ball scene. This is not what we're going to have. We're going to have the scene where the parents go for the portrait. But there's a ballroom where she, a, a painter who is non-Jewish, meets her and, without knowing she's Jewish, has a um, sort of anti-semitic anti, makes an anti-semitic remark then tries to turn it into something else that Jews are really the essence of the he's a very attractive dashing figure 
and he then meets her, asks to meet her parents, which he does, and wants to paint them. And they represent something to him that's this completely exotic culture. And so the scene, and, and Sophie is herself somewhat taken with him. Uh, the scene we're going to see is when the parents, Erlon Josephson, who you just saw in Scenes from a Marriage, is the father, go to have their portrait painted, and then eventually Sophie comes to see it. So can we have that clip? I'm really proud of that film, I have to tell you. Uh -huh. You should be. <laughs> <laughs> amazing. It's hard to believe it's your first feature film, the performances you get. There are others, we could have, there were so many things we could have shown, but there's a scene where it's later on, um, Jonas, the man who will become Sophie's husband, comes to pay a call, for, comes to pay his first call, and the parents are sitting as they all, always are, and they have this wonderful marriage, which is another thing. You feel the, the disintegration of the whole Jewish community here and of, of this kind of marriage that, that Sophie hopes to have and, and fails. Um, she's had, well, no, that's later, but so Jonas comes to call, and he's the parent's choice, actually, and she doesn't know this, and he comes in, and it turns out he plays the piano, and he, they ask him to play, and Sophie says, oh, yes, do please play, and so he's playing along, and she's standing behind the piano looking pleased and, and enjoying the music, and, so, and she, she looks at the parents, then she keeps looking fairly pleased, then she looks at him again, and suddenly her whole expression changes and she suddenly understands why he's here and it's like her whole fate is sealed in that moment at least this is the way I, oh, I see it she, yeah. she knows it's she's going to marry him and and everything is over in a way um, I mean she doesn't know that she hopes that it will be a good marriage but it, she doesn't even need to ask the parent there's no no, no point in no, arguing it's all it. and it's all in in, in, in her, her expression face yeah. yeah which I think is Wonderful. That's, a, That's a wonderful thing with film, as opposed to theater, that you can take away all the words and all the explanations, and you just put a camera on a face, and if that face knows how to express, which this actress does, you know, you you read a life in a face, and actually you recognize it because it's happened to you, too. Yeah, it's, but it's a it's a very subtle thing too. I mean, it's not yeah. and, and it's for uh, sophisticated audiences. That's what concerns me. I mean, I think this is not going to ma make it with, uh, you know, people oh, that yeah. go to see oh, I'm sure uh, it Hollywood will. films. Yes, it's a, it's a movie with maybe another rhythm than a lot of movies, because I also wanted to remind people of the pace we are really born to. Our pace is really much more like this. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and then something there and something there. And this is also 100 years ago when obviously the pace was even slower. But I do believe so much in audiences that I know if they sit together just like we do now and it's dark there and something is happening there, and if they allow the time and they know, okay, now it's two hours and 20 minutes of my life, if they allow them to lean back and, and sit there this pace, which is part of us all, is lingering within us, and I'm sure we are even longing for it. If that can just invade your soul and things can take their time, it's going to be exciting and, and fulfilling, and I wanted to do that. And I, I have to say my producers were very brave because they allowed me. And, and uh, it has turned out it's not for sophisticated people or intelligent people or this or that. It's for all that too, but it's really made with the heart and it's made for the heart, nothing else. Just go right to the heart. Mm -hmm. And and so I, I believe tremendously in, um, in movie houses still being one of the few places where people can have this uh, And you have experience. faith that your audience will understand. They will see the scope. I mean, what's interesting is you see uh, different generations, and you see people leaving. There are a lot of scenes where people, people are always leaving, which is what life is, saying goodbye to people. But we've all had it happening to mm. us, and, and uh, we all know it's going to come in the future, and in the end we're going to leave ourselves. So there's nothing in this film that isn't experienced daily one way or another by everyone. Who of us experience being in the jungle meeting Rambo? None of us. It's, it's, you know, it's, 
It's not going to give anything to our life. It's not recognizable. And the most wondrous moments of our lives, when we look back at it, wasn't the big explosions. It was really those moments when we were recognized or when we were touched or when we touched somebody or felt some skin under our hands. That is the things mm. we remember, the goodbyes and the hellos. Mm. I'm going to ask one more thing, and then we're going to open it to questions. But there's one interesting thing in the film, which you th it starts out being about Sophie. But there's a tension between the, so the woman's experience and the Jewish experience, because, of course, this is a very patriarchal culture. And ultimately, it's Sophie's son who goes out into the world. Um, there's an irony there, too, of the Jewish hope for assimilation, hoping that that is the, the future for them. And, of course, we know from the war that it wasn't, that, um, and w w what is going to happen. But Sophie starts out full of hope, but there's a line in there somewhere about, the, and, and the Josephson character is always going to his cafe. This is part of his daily ritual where he reads the newspaper and he knows what's going on in the world, and the women are always at home. And some line about a woman that stays at home never has anything interesting to say. So you're very aware, I think, of the constraints on women, but somehow, I mean, Sophie's story, suddenly it becomes really the story of the son. Yeah, well, I have to say that I do believe that a woman who stays at home and has made that choice has a lot of interesting things mm. to say, unless mm -hmm. she's just sitting and watching soap operas. But they didn't do that at that time. It is Sophia who says that uh, she's saying that, you know, a woman who only is sitting there with her knitting and that's it, mm. out from that knitting is not coming any deep thoughts, but she, in a way, is wrong because Sophia's life did not become a life of somebody who left the home, but in her life she actually uh, evolved, yeah, evolved a lot. Yeah. She started to write, she, she read a lot, she put a lot of uh, wisdom into her son, I believe, in, in what she was telling him, among other things, never to forget his roots. And then she did something wonderful that I must say I didn't do, who have been so liberated kind of all my life. Uh, when my child was uh, leaving home, you know, my child saw a really c crying mother, and if I could have given her guilt on the way for leaving me, I would have done it. I couldn't because <laughs> she knew that I, I had been working and would have a life also when she left. But I. I cried and I said, maybe you're too young, maybe you should wait and whatever. Although she was, uh, you know, more than tw 20. But what Sophia did, who had stayed home all her life and also married who her parents said and led the life that she was asked to lead, when the time came for her son and she had pictured the two of them living in harmony and he would come home and she could make a home for him, also as a young man, and she says, isn't it good, now it's the two of us, and we, we will have a wonderful life together, and he said, no, I want to leave, you know. Maybe it was right for you, your life, but it's not right for me. And at the moment when her life, her dreams are kind of being crushed. She has nothing else, really. She has nothing else, in a way, we have been led to believe. But when he stands there in the hall with his suitcases and suddenly is a little boy and, uh, you know, regretting that he's leaving home, what does she do? She says, happy voyage, mm -hmm. and she pushes him out of the door. And, and um, this an was act, not act. in the book, you really? know, but I wanted to give it uh, to my daughter, and mm -hmm. I wanted to give it to Sophia. I just think it is so... Wonderful. That she heroic pushes, thing yeah. of letting go. That is of the, the hardest go. and the most beautiful thing that either either child or a parent can do. I mean, it's what in Autumn Sonata they couldn't do. No. But here she does. But it's yeah. it's terribly hard. Mm. And if that is all one can do, maybe from one generation to the next to do just one more thing that helps set somebody Well, it's the greatest free. act of love in a way there is, if a mother yeah. can actually let her child go, yeah. let her separate from But her. it's it sure is hard, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, with the little time that we have left, let's have some questions from the audience. Yes. Um, a little bit about your capacity for anguish and how you didn't want to do another nightmare and Fanny Alexander 
Um, can you talk a little bit about the emotional toll it took to make a movie like Cries and Whispers or Face to Face? Did coming home at night, was it hard? After the shooting was over, did you have to recover? What kind of experience was that? Well, no. It, no, it, because it's kind of wonderful to do, you know, to cry and to have all these hysterics. You get a lot of, you know, frustrations out that way. And I, I have never been that kind of actress who, uh, you know, did the method and had to sit home and uh, contemplate suicide to be able to do it on, on film. I, I, I always thought the fun of acting is when the camera comes on, there I come on. And when it goes off, Leave is having a wonderful time. And, and I, I, to me, that is important. And I always have a kind of suspicion towards actors who are using a lot of strengths, uh, uh, pretending, you know, when the camera's off, like they are so deep into it. I don't believe that, because you really use up a lot of energy, which you will not have uh, once uh, you are supposed to have the energy. So, no, it's not an emotional strain. On the contrary, it's, it's, um, I think acting is fun. I thought it was more fun when I was younger. <coughs> but it, it, it's, it's fun. What a work to have. It's, all of us did it as children, and for some of us to have it as a profession, we are, we are really very lucky, I think. Yes. Earlier you said you were so identified with the... With the Bergman clan of actors, and you said you wonder what you might have been. What's your I wish list if you could have gone on a completely different screen persona? What would that be? Well, I always thought I was a, you know, a comedy actress, but I, I never did that <laughs> on the theater or, or films. Uh, actually, I did one film, 40 Carats, but uh, that was really not uh, very successful. And that was couldn't be a comedy the way it was set up because I was to be a 40-year-old, very sophisticated New York woman and fall in love with a 20-year-old. And at that time, I was 30 and I came right out of Norway with a heavy accent and the one I fell in love with who was to be 20 was 29, Eddie Albert, and we looked the same age. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it, it, it was self-defying. And well, I, I, know, I, yeah. I remember you told me at the time, because we talked about that, and you said since you, you, they, in, instead of trying to make you look old, they tried to make you look old, but instead of making you look old, they just made you look ugly. Uh, yes. <laughs> Frumpy, yeah. <laughs> yes. In Sophie, the, the, precisely what you were talking about before you opened the question, wasn't there, there was this scene in which her mother prepares her for the son leaving. Am I not right? Yes. And she says, your son will do. Be what careful. You haven't done. Oh, be so careful. your son, yeah. And it, that's another scene. There are a lot of scenes that are not in the book, but that came out because it were things I felt was important to say, and I felt it was still, you know, part of what the writer wouldn't have minded. And that scene happened because uh, the woman who plays Sophia, the lead actress, and the one who plays her mother, Gita Nerby, and I, we were sitting talking about, be just before the shooting started, our mothers, and how our mothers had been very strong always and made decisions for us and so. And so I decided that I'd make a, a, a scene in the film where Sophia finally does tell her mother that she feels the mother has kind of limited her choices in, in life. And they, they wanted that too. And while I was writing this, I, I got a telephone call from my daughter you know, b blaming me for something that I felt I was not responsible for. And suddenly, I was on the mother's side. There is some unfairness here. So the scene starts with the daughter the re uh, rebelling towards the mother, but it does, in fact, end taking the mother's side, saying, OK, I did mistakes. I admit that. As a mother, I've done mistakes. But don't now in the upbringing of your own child, because that's what my daughter said too, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to say that to my son or whatever. I don't. And so the mother says, be careful so you 
while avoiding, trying to avoid everything I did wrong. Be careful then that that doesn't put you into, you know, doing things, directing your own, uh, own son. So I like that scene uh, very much. Right, so, then, so then his leaving, she was in some, at least I felt, that she was very psychically prepared for his leaving. Not but so. Is that, is that not so. She, she heard the words, but you know, uh, probably, yes, it was somewhere inside of her, but I, I don't think she was ever aware that her mother would uh, be right about that thing. Like, you know, when he, the son is learning to read, and she's just sitting admiring him that he can read, and he's reading about six million people dying uh, in India of starvation. It's the same number. She's a Jewish mother. And she's just smiling because her, her son knows how to read. She doesn't even hear what he's saying. But again, that's another number, another thing about destiny that you don't hear, but somewhere it stays within you. And Sophia's children would be maybe, or her son, maybe one of the six million who died in the Second World War. Speaking of that, you know, you've, you've been involved in a lot of international activities and UNICEF and refugee children, also with Jewish causes and activities. Was it just coincidence that this was a Jewish subject that, or were you, did, how did, I mean, you have an affinity there, how did that come about? Well, no, I, yes, I, I always wondered why they asked me to do mm. this special subject, because I'm a Christian and I'm Norwegian and, and it's a, a story about a Jewish family in Denmark. But there has come to me this way a lot of things that has been tied up with the uh, Jewish community. I, I think that in many ways they have represented uh, a people that through centuries, maybe more than any, has been uh, persecuted just because of where they come from through history, so maybe they are the best example of what we do without understanding uh, in terms of who is different from ourselves. And this is also why I have dedicated the picture to my own grandson, Halfdan, who is Christian, and my husband's grandchild, Tali, who is Jewish, mm -hmm. hoping that when they grow up one day, that differences will be something to be celebrated, yeah. not persecuted. Yes. In the uh, beginning of the film, when the family is moving around, it's a very opulent room and, and all, all kinds of uh, signs of wealth. And then as the movie went on and after the artist came in, he had met her at a very uh, gay event, people in very strong clothes. Then they went to his studio. And he was in the colors of, I think, the Norwegian flag or whatever, blue and yellow, the, the artist, who had made the anti-Semitic and then he painted a picture, and read it in the end where the lady, uh, Sophie, and he are bidding over this picture that he created. And I threw the picture in the film. I saw part of what you had just talked about. And I, I was wondering if it was conscious effort to put the uh, people of the earth, very simple, very, uh, and, and the artists <coughs> in a uh, kind of a corrupted persona. Well, but, you know, there are so many things you put into a film that maybe people do not see, and then the strange thing, what happens is that there are a lot of things that you did not see, that people see, that also are 
Very true. And I think that's the most wonderful thing with art, that you are allowed to to give it your own interpretation because it is what uh, you recognize. And of course, very much in the film is comments about being an artist and what do people recognize as art or what do they recognize uh, in art? Yes, one more question, I guess. Yes. Uh, yesterday, the newspaper here uh, alluded to something that I've wondered about for years, having been in Norway and knowing something about the culture there and the culture here. And that is uh, uh, whether you could have flourished as much as an actress in Hollywood or could have made a film like Sophie, uh, could have directed a film being a Hollywood actress, like being a Norwegian in America. Well, I don't know. Hollywood and I kind of didn't strike it out too well. <laughs> and, and in many ways, I, I am so um, lucky for that. And it's not so a grapes because, I, of course, if they had loved me, I, I would have stayed. And if I had been a big movie star, maybe I would have been happy then too. But I do doubt it, and I doubt that I would have had such a fantastic, rich life as I've had to write books, to to travel for the United Nations and and have to overcome certain things and the freedom of choice that I've had because I don't have to look at box office because there isn't any box office anyway in, in my life. But the, instead then do what feels right for me is what the no from Hollywood gave me. And the yes from where I am working did include Sophia, and obviously a picture like Sophia, I could never have made in Hollywood. Maybe I would have been, you know, so big that I could have made another movie, but it wouldn't have been Sophia. And I know had I lived in Hollywood, I wouldn't even have known that well, the story of Sophia, because I needed a lot of reality, which I've had thanks to the rejection. I'm curious, A, what the budget on Sophia was, but I also have another question for you. Having, having interacted with a recognized genius for 20 years, I'm curious about your perception of, of, um, of American uh, artists now in the film industry. Is there anyone you perceive in, in script writing, directing, and, and acting, do you perceive any geniuses on the scene right now in America from your perspective, having been involved with one for so long? <laughs> well, um, the budget of the film was $2 million, which of course is very, very little because it's a big period piece. And we didn't go a day, an hour over, over time or even over budget. Uh, sometimes when I call Ingmar Bergman a genius, I'm a little flippant. <laughs> I, I, th I think he's a great, great filmmaker, and he will stay in film history as uh, uh, one of the very best. Uh, I'm very scared of thinking of anybody as geniuses, because I think a life includes... Uh, everything, wholeness, and some people excel in their work, and some people excel just in one action, and and it's dangerous to be surrounded and honoring geniuses too much, because it may make us listen too much to them and turn away from other things that also might be positive in our lives. He's one of my, my very best friends. He's the father of my child. Obviously, I think he's a great man. I don't believe in geniuses. What about people that might, you might really think their work is a, a high caliber in the American films and uh, writing or directing or acting? I'm afraid of mentioning names because I might, you know, forget somebody that I really... Admire, I, I think Altman, I think his film Players was just uh, wonderful. Scorsese, uh, I'm so terrible with names. And also, there's one thing that doesn't follow. 
I came from Norway yesterday, so I'm on uh, what they call jet lag. <laughs> so I know there are certain names that would slip me. You, I, I, th I think Woody Allen has made some wonderful films. I, I love John Cassavetes. Um, there are several. Um, and you're middle, in the middle of Unforgiven. And, uh, oh, yes, uh, yes, I am. Clint Eastwood. Uh, I think, you know, what a career, you know, to be associated with what they call spaghetti movies. And I'm, I'm sure he has some of the handicaps, you know, that uh, I would have had being middle-aged and actress and whatever. What is he? He's even more than middle-aged and you cowboy and actor and whatever. And look what he's doing. Look what's in that man. And this film, Unforgiven, Unforgiving? Unforgiving. Un yes, it's just incredible. And I bet you if it hadn't been made by Clint Eastwood but by some other certified genius, it would have been called a work of uh, a genius. Well, I, not many uh, male actor directors would do that. Would play a broken down cowboy. No, I mean, it's something very goes against the grain. Of I the, know of, of the mythology. Yeah. So both his <coughs> acting and the choice and his directing is is really good. I mean, are we allowed to go on any longer? Where are the powers that be? Here's an, another question. Just yeah, are you gonna um, do a comment? <laughs> <laughs> when somebody asks me. But they don't. <laughs> yes? Um, I just wanted to say, it seems that most of the people that ask me questions have been men, and maybe it's just hard for women to talk in large groups. I don't know what it is, but I wanted to say I saw Sophie last night, and from one woman to another, it was just an absolutely life affirming movie. It was absolutely beautiful, I think. Thank you. Well, it has a lot to do with sisterhood, too, you know. Um, and that we finally have, that we dare to talk. As I said, well, I started out a non-talker and really so shy and, uh, and timid. And I, I, I have found great strength in, in uh, other women talking to them and also other men that... Uh, you know, thought I was uh, okay, and we and we shouldn't be um, scared of each other. We should really evaluate each other. <laughs> well, it has just been bought by an American distributor, and uh, so. Arrow film, and so hopefully it will come back here. Okay, well, thank you all for coming, and thank you. All.